Welcome to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, transformative studies in the Word of God. I'm Pastor John Harris, and this is my podcast. Our topic today is on the devil's devices. I bet you've thought about that. How does the devil work? How can he get a hold of you? Can he can he cause you to sin? Can he take you over? How's he working the lost? You know, the Bible has much to say about it. We're going to open up the Word and check it out. Join me over the next few weeks as we open up this study and find out what God's Word has to say about the devil. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We've been looking at, we are not ignorant of his devices, talking about Satan and how he operates. And um, we've seen over the last couple of weeks that Satan is, control, is in control of both heaven and earth, that we're on a battleground and that the, we're in enemy territory, that the days are evil, and God has called us to stand, to, uh, to stand up and to uh, be on that battlefield working and carrying out his business and doing what uh, we ought to be doing. Uh, we're told to redeem the time, to arise, to awake. Uh, to, to get up and, and, and be in the battle, to be soldiers, to endure hardness. Uh, we're to be busy. And, uh, but Satan's out there. Satan and his, his host are out there. Satan, uh, you should know, is, is, is limited. He is not a god. He is a created creature. He was, not, he was created, but he's very powerful. He's not omniscient. He can't read your mind, so he doesn't know what's going on in your head. But he can see and do and he can he can be involved in many activities he can only be in one place at one time but uh, because he has a rather large host of of uh, ministering spirits uh, the bible talks about him as fall as angels fallen angels demons spirits they're all the same uh, they're out working they're agents that, uh, that are gathering information for him and he doesn't like you he doesn't like me because we're standing for truth uh, he doesn't like you because you're members of the body of Christ. That you are, you are part of God's plan to subdue heavenly places. So what is Satan doing? What is he doing to you? What can he do to us? And uh, I mentioned right at the end of last week that there are four, I see, four major ways, four major modes of attack that Satan is using. And he uses the world, which he has designed, which we're going to look at tonight a little bit. He uses unbelievers, and you know that. I mean, we've heard a lot about that tonight. He uses fallen angels, ministering spirits. And he also uses believers. Believers that are trapped in their carnality or unestablished. Satan can use them all. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. And first, let's look at the world. Spend a few moments looking at the world and the way it is. This world system that, that's, that, that we live in, this, the, the, the way things are out there, Satan has designed. Look what it says in Ephesians 2. Verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. See that? You walked according to the course of what? This world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now now worketh in the children of disobedience. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We do pray, Lord, now that your Holy Spirit might open our hearts and our minds, that we might receive the word as it is, the word of God. We might by faith, Lord, take it into ourselves and into our lives, into our hearts, and into our minds. That it might change us, Lord. That we might see things as they really are. That we might see the unseen. That we might be able to realize what is really going on and that there is a conflict. And that you have a purpose for us each day in this battle that is carrying on. Lord God, we praise you and thank you for all that you will do and are doing. We praise you for these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Look what it says there in Ephesians 2, verse 2. Where in time past you walked it according to the, what? The course of this world. According to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Verse 3 says, Among whom also we all had our conversation, our manner of life, where we used to abode in times past. What's it say there? In the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. See, before we were saved, we were just like the, uh, the rest of the world, right? We were part of it. We were part of that course. We were running that course that the way it was designed. There, there's, there's the, 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 that world, the world out there is designed upon principles of the one who has constructed it. That is the prince, the power of the air, Satan. Back in Ezekiel 28, we looked at this the first week we were together a couple weeks ago. 
we saw that Satan was full of wisdom. He was perfect in beauty, and he was lifted up by pride. That's sort of how things are out there. Okay? They're based upon beauty and, and wisdom, but not God's wisdom. Man's wisdom. Wisdom of the way, you know, you know, get yourself to the top any way you can. That's wise, you know. Doesn't matter how you make your money. Just, you've got lots of money. You must have been pretty wise. Pride. Be all what? Be all what? You can be, right? Uh, you hear all kinds of stuff about self-esteem. You know, ego. You know, you want to damage anybody's ego. Well, what's God say about our esteem? Are we supposed to be concerned about our esteem? God says to esteem others what? Better than ourselves, right? The world is focused on I, 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 I. But God says to focus on what? Each other. On you, 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 you. To love one another, to build up one another, to edify one another, to help one another, to lift up one another. Right? To lift your burdens, each other's burdens. That's not the way the world is. You're a fool if you take, you know, if you pay attention to other people of yourself, according to the world, right? Go over to 1 John chapter 2, and then gra go ahead and grab Ephesians, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 3. So 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, and Ephesians, or excuse me, Genesis, I'm sorry, I keep saying Ephesians, Genesis chapter 3. So you got like most of the Bible between your fingers there, right? Right, the beginning and the end. Look, it says in 1 John chapter 2. It sort of, by the way, reiterates what it says there in Ephesians chapter 2 there. The lust of your, eye, lust of your flesh, lust of your eyes, and desires of your mind. 1 John 2 verse 15. 1 John 2 verse 15 describes the world. It says, love not the world. That's the, the what, what's out there. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, that you place it first in your life, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16. For the, here's a description of it. For all that is in the world, here it is, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is what? It's not of the Father, but is what? Is of the world. The world has a threefold mechanism by which it allures us. The lust of the eyes, or excuse me, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. You know, and Satan designed it that way. Look way, look way back in Genesis chapter 3. Keep your mind on that there. Think of that. It says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Look at Genesis 3, verse 6. Here's Eve. So you initially see you have the lust of the flesh. Genesis 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, mm, that'd be yummy, right? Be good for me, right? That's the lust of the flesh. And that it was what? Pleasant to the eyes. It looked really good. And a tree to be desired to make what? What? One wise. That's the pride. The pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. That's the way the world is. Okay? It goes after you. The world is designed by Satan. And our old nature, our flesh, just like there with Eve and just like uh, John's warning about and just like Paul says in, in Ephesians 2, that's the way that we all had our conversation in times past in those things. That world that's out there is in tune with our flesh. It resonates with our old nature. And it's, very di it's difficult to, uh, to get away from it because you're in it. It's the battlefield that we're in. And Satan has designed it. The battlefield, the place, the world you live in, he has designed. And it is designed to go after your flesh and my flesh to drag us away from the things of God. Because it's not of God, it's of the world. It's of Satan. It's his. He's the prince, the power of the air. What's Romans 12 verse 2 say? And be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove was a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know what God says? Don't be conformed to this world. The natural process is that we will conform to the way things are about us. It takes effort 
in order not to be conformed. You have to be transformed. How do you get transformed? You have to renew your mind. You have to think differently, right? I have a little demonstration for you. Raymond was up here trying to check it out earlier, and he slipped out. You know what these things are? You ever see these? You know what this is? It's a tuning fork, right? That's a tuning fork. If you hit it, it vibrates at a certain frequency. Well, this is the world. And this is your flesh. Watch what happens. By the way, I'll keep this away from here for a second. If I hit this, watch what happens. It stops, right? Can you hear that? Right? Watch this. I'll put these next to each other. Do you hear something? Do you hear something? That's this tuning fork. That tuning fork is tuned to the frequency of this tuning fork. They're the same. And our flesh is in tune with the world like that. And when, it, when the world vibrates, our flesh responds to it. Okay? Our flesh responds to it. But what God wants us to do is to be transformed and become out of tune with the world. What I did, I just tuned that, fre that tuning fork to a different frequency. You hear anything? It doesn't respond to it. That is a transformed individual. An individual who has changed, okay? Has changed their, 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 the way they resonate with the world. They're no longer in tune with the frequency. They're no longer in tune with the world, but they're in tune with God. Well, let me show you something. Even a transformed individual can get back in tune. If that person decides to, uh, I don't know if I can do this together here. Do you hear that? That's called a beat frequency in physics. What's happening is they, they're, they're, it's out of tune, by the way. If I had to hit this by itself, that doesn't vibrate with it. But if this decides to walk in a way that's close to this, it'll vibrate with it. And it vacillates. It goes up and down. A lot of Christians' lives are like that. They're, they're, they're trying to live a life that's well-pleasing unto God. But then they fall. And they falter. And they start doing things the world's way. And then they oscillate back and forth. And, you know, it's like Romans 7. You know, this, this up and down experience where Paul says, The things I want to do, I can't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. Just back and forth. And it's just a clash. Satan's designed it that way. It goes after our flesh. See, we need to be out of tune with the world. Okay, we need to be in tune with God. So we resonate with God. See, the battlefield out there is stacked against us. Okay? It's, it, everything out there draws at us. It operates by His rules. It operates by His structure, not God's. And it lies to us. It lies to each and every one of us. It says things like, you know, sin is okay, it's pleasurable, but it's only a season. It's only for a season. And you know what? God says something very true, that sowing to your flesh reaps corruption. And the world lies as, oh, it's later on, right? We're in this sort of like take care of things right now mentality. And Satan has duped us by that. Be all you can be. But God says, humble yourself. You know, gain is what? Godliness, right? No. That's not true. Gain is not necessarily godliness, right? You know what? Here, here's the big one. Everybody thinks that they're owed something in this world. You know that? Yeah, you owe me. I deserve this. Here people get up so upset because they don't get something the way they should. They think they should. You know what? We owe everything to who? God. He is a provider of everything. And we should be thankful for that which God provides for us. Godliness with what is great gain? Godliness with contentment is great gain. That's seeing it God's way. 
The world's out there and they say, man is God. But man is really dust. He is nothing. Love yourself. Right? No, love others. See, the world lies. And, it, and Satan uses it to go after us. See, the world permeates every... The reason I want to look at the world is just for those few moments there is the world permeates every attack that Satan brings at us. As he uses other issues, but he's designed the playing field. And you're on it. And you're to stand up out there. And if you don't know how that world's designed and how your flesh resonates with it and how you need to get out of tune, that is, you've got to do things God's way. Do it, his, you know, do it exactly like God says. Otherwise, you're going to fall because you're going to just start vibrating, resonating with the world. And before you know it, you'll be out there doing things that you don't want to do. The world system is the backdrop. It's the fabric for what Satan uses to attack us. So let's look at the first mechanism. Ephesians 2 again. Ephesians 2. Children of disobedience. Children of disobedience. I'm not talking about disobedient children. Okay. I'm talking about children of disobedience. Ephesians 2. It's going to seem maybe a little weird tonight. I don't know. At least tonight and next week will be. Ephesians 2, verse 1 says, Where in time past, excuse me, and you had to quicken who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 2, now. Where in time past you walked according to the, according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that what? Now worketh in the children of disobedience. And by the way, we all had our conversation in time past on that. So he's talking about the difference between unbelievers and believers. Okay. See, we're not there now. But as an unbeliever, before we knew Christ, we were in the same way. We're in the same boat. The spirit that works in the lost, the unbelieving, those who don't know Christ, is whose spirit? What's it say there? It's the prince, the power of the air. It's Satan's spirit. Now, that, that seems a little far-fetched. It's his spirit. It's not God's spirit. Who's, who indwells you? You know, you have a spirit in you, right? You know, the God. You know, we talk about... Go to Ephesians 1 there. Just flip over a page. Ephesians 1, verse 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were what? Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Right? And we look at that and we say, look, that God puts us in the body of Christ. And he seals us there and we can't get out and we have eternal security and that's all true. But there's another reason. You know, when you seal something, you seal a jar. See, we, we think of God the Holy Spirit sealing us as like he keeps us in the body, right? But you know what? When something's sealed, that means something can't get in either. Right? It's protected. It is guarded. And God the Holy Spirit takes up resonance in you and I to protect us because there is a spirit out there who wants to work against you and he's in the lost okay now he's not it's not like we're not talking about all kinds of people running around demon possessed can it be yeah well you know god's word does indicate it's true it can be but it, it, and to some extent we're gonna look at what what it means to be to be that way anyways there's a spirit in them and it's his spirit okay it's his spirit and they, the lost, are in tune with Satan and how the world is. They're just in tune with him. And they think and operate just like that. And you know that. I got a little piece of fuzz flying there. Okay. You know that, right? You've seen people do some things out there that if you did them, you would be utterly aghast. How could that possibly happen? People drowning their children in swimming pools. Throwing them in dumpsters. The lost resonate. They vibrate. They're right in tune with Satan and his spirit. Well, how is that possible? Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Next week we'll talk about psychic friends if you want. You know, that Cleo lady. Well, we're not going to get to her tonight, but might talk to her and see what, you know, see what that has to do with. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, notice verse 3. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the what? 
the God of this world, see the spirit that's in them, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. It says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts, so we're no longer blind, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, Satan's out there blinding the lost so they don't see the gospel. They don't understand it. But see, the spirit that's in them is in tune with the world. And it's just the way Satan's designed. And so it's, that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, what, you know one thing that people hate? Everybody hates change. You know that? Everybody, you know, don't you get annoyed when things change? It bothers you when things change. But the bitter reality is change happens all the time. Look in the mirror. Okay? Step on the scales. I mean, change happens all the time. It's everything changes. But we like, we're, we're trying to control things. That's why we don't like change. And the, uh, the thing that we all need to understand is that there is no control. So you have to trust. But the world doesn't like change. Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody and you wonder why they get so upset? You're telling them to change everything they've ever understood. You're telling them, you're, you're trying to shine a bright light in the darkness. And it may be dark, but you know where they know where all their things at. A blind person, you go into a blind person's house and you change and you just rearrange all the furniture on them. Okay, and see how annoyed it gets. That's what it is when you try to share the gospel. And all you're trying to do is turn on the lights. But Satan has blinded them because this is the way it is. And so the gospel just, it, it, it has a hard time penetrating. But God the Holy Spirit can work through those things. But see, they have a spirit in them that's working against it. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at the Apostle Paul and how he was confronted with unbelievers. And you're going to see how unbelievers attack and how and the mechanism by which they go here. Um, so anyways, Satan blinds by first, he has the world designed for, for the flesh. And since they only have the flesh, they're the natural man, they're only their own, they only have the old nature, they don't have a new nature, they don't have anything from God in them, they don't have God the Holy Spirit in them protecting them or providing light, they're blind. What's the other way that Satan uses to blind the lost? One is the world. What's the other way? There's one other way. There's, there's a number of ways. One other significant way. See, the world goes after the flesh, right? So maybe the, the darker eyes of the flesh. But what about those? You, you've, known, you've known righteous people, haven't you? Very good people, right? Go to church all the time, right? Well, Satan uses religion to blind people, too. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. It's easy to talk about how Satan works against unbelievers. They're, they're not us. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. For such, verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 11. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves in the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the what? The ministers of righteousness, right? And it says, whose end shall be according to their works. That is, there's, I mean, there are those. I mean, you can't get everybody by just throwing the world at them, okay? And let them wallow around in the garbage out there. Because there are some people who have a conscience. God gave them that way back when. So Satan goes after them another way. He gives, them, he gives them the ability to be righteous. He throws at them false religions, a, a system of works, a system of a way of doing something that makes you good. Okay? So he has them blinded. Okay? He has them blinded. But that's part of the world that Satan's designed. Three categories of unbelievers. Okay? And the three categories of unbelievers, if you want to look, uh, I, I, I think, anyways, I see three major ones, has to do with the level of attachment or influence of that spirit that's within them, okay? They have, they have a, you know, that spirit that works within them, that which is the prince of power of the air, Satan's spirit. It depends on how the level of control, okay? And um, there are, uh, maybe to get an understanding of that, let's look at believers. You have a spirit in you, right? Right? Is that right? 
God, the Holy Spirit, indwells you. Is every one of you controlled or under the, you know, being led, following moment by moment, God, the Holy Spirit? You know, Paul says, be filled with the Spirit, right? Go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 18. Well, start in verse 14. We'll start right there. Wherefore he saith, Ephesians 5, 14. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, but be what? But be filled with the what? The Spirit. That means, guess what? You might not be. Now, does that mean that God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't indwell you? No. See, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be filled by the Spirit? To be led. What's Romans 8 say? Go to Romans 8. Be filled with the Spirit means that you're following, you're, you're, you're letting it influence you strongly, Right? Romans 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but what? After the Spirit. Look over at verse uh, 13. For if you live after the flesh, so if you, you know, basically you're following after the flesh, ye shall die. That is, you're going to reap corruption. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They have a very special, real, experiential relationship with God. To be filled with the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, is, it has a very special, real relationship with God. And a lot of believers don't have that because they're led, they're, 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 they keep vibrating back and forth between the world and what Satan is designed. And so they don't feel that real presence of God in their lives. So you have those being filled with the Spirit. And then you have those that are maybe back and forth. There's another category of believer, though. There is a concern in Scripture that you might quench the Spirit, right? That you might quench it. That you shut it off so it doesn't have any influence at all, right? So you have those who are filled with the Spirit, which are under have the very real presence of God in their lives. That they know it, he's, he, it, he's manifesting, and they're following, and they're led by it. And you have those that are sort of vacillating back and forth between the world and the Spirit. You know, it says, go to, go, go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. See, the, the flesh and the Spirit are contrary one to another. At any given instant in time, you are either in the Spirit or you're in your flesh. Either you're being controlled and led by the Spirit or you're being controlled and led by your flesh. Galatians 5, verse 17 says this. Well, verse 6, 15, 16. Galatians 5, 16, sorry. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the what? The lust of the flesh. Okay, verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. So you have believers that are right there. Okay, so you have believers that are in the flesh, spirit, back, and God tells you exactly how to, how to walk in the spirit. You can do it. it. Takes the word of God. It requires being transformed, that you're changed, that you think differently, that you have a renewed mind, that you see things God's way with His eyes and with His understanding of the way things are, and you can walk that way. Now, the reason I went there is because I wanted to show you what it means, what, how are Satan's Host. You know, how, how do the unbelievers, because they're filled with, they have a spirit. But you know what? There are some who are filled with the spirit. Okay? Now, it takes effort to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. It takes labor and it takes work. You have to, you have to labor in the word. You have to trust. You have faith. Okay? You know what? There are those who are filled with Satan's spirit, but they have require effort. They have to work at it. Okay? We're going to look at those next time. Okay? They, they require work. You know, they, they go through a, a variety of ways to become in tune with that, that, that spirit. Okay. The scripture calls them sorcerers. They talk about witchcraft. They talk about curious arts. They talk about familiar spirits. Um, things like that. Div uh, spirits of divination. Soothsaying. Uh, tarot cards. Astrology. Mantras. Eastern religions. 
Those are ways that people try to get in tune with that spirit. Because they're not getting in tune with God. They're not trying to find Him. They're trying to find that spirit that's in them. It takes effort. Then there are those who aren't filled with Satan's spirit. By the way, those who are filled with Satan's spirit, you know what? They're under His control. They're led. And they're, they're, they're like the first wave of attack if you stand up sometimes. Okay? They show up on important occasions because they're easily influenced by Satan and his, and his, his group. Then there are those unbelievers out there that they vacillate. You know, sometimes they're under the control and they're led by them. Sometimes they're not. Okay? They, they're, sometimes they're in tune with that, that old nature, that, that, that spirit that's in them. Sometimes they're not. And then there are those who are probably quenched the Satan's spirit. That is, that they're, they're still unbelieving, but they're quenched. His spirit doesn't seem to affect them. And I think those are people who are under conviction, but that's a little different thing. As when they're convicted by God, the Holy Spirit, and he's working on them, Satan can't touch them. So you have three. And what we're going to look at next time, well, just, we'll just look at the first one. Give me one minute. Go to Acts chapter 13, just so you uh, see one who is filled with Satan's spirit. Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul. Not the Apostle Paul, but Apostle Paul came across somebody. And we'll just look at this one. We could go back to 1 Samuel, look at some back in the Old Testament. Let's just look at some here right in this dispensation. Acts chapter 13, verse 7, or 6. And when they had gone through the isle on the Paphos, they found a certain, what? Sorcerer. A sorcerer is a person who's been working. Working very diligently to get, in, to get, in, get into that link with that spirit. They found a certain source for a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was the deputy of the country. Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So here's an individual, another individual wants to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the sorcerer, that's the person up above, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, notice what it says there, filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, he's trying to demonstrate that one was filled with the Spirit, one was filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said this, O full, filled to the rim, of all subtlety and all mischief, thou what? Child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? When Paul shows up in the scene, Satan knew what Paul was doing, so he sent out somebody to stop him. Try to discourage them, knock them down, take them out of the battle right off the bat. You know, the very first time, um, we did some door-to-door -door a number of years ago, and the very first door I went to, the very first door I went to, I opened, I knocked on the door, and the person slammed and said, oh, you're one of those culpites, and slammed the door in our face. I was like, you yeah, know, sort of a little discouraging there. We were a culpite, okay, I thought that was interesting. I was about to revival church. I didn't know I was a culpite, whatever that means, okay, but I found out that means it's not necessarily a good thing. It's right up the hill here. So I don't think they like being too close to the Bible church. You know what? I'm trying to shut you down. Stop you. That's a person filled with the Spirit. Sorcerer. We're going to look at that next time a little bit. Filled with a Spirit. See, some of Satan's... His Spirit's in all of them. But some are very much in tune. Okay? And some aren't. Some aren't even at all. So we're going to look at it. And by the way, they're used. Satan uses them with the world to attack you. To take you out of the battle. Today, Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for your word. You've been listening to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, Transformer Studies in the Word of God. I hope you've enjoyed the study. Please subscribe, like, and comment. This podcast is available on many podcast platforms. Just search on the title. Now, until next time, fight the good fight of faith and God's best to you.